Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, it is 7 o'clock, and so I want to be respectful of everyone's time uh, so that we can get started with our discussion. Uh, my name is Christopher Miller. I am the Senior Director of Education and Community Engagement here at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. On behalf of our staff, our volunteers, and our board, I welcome all of you this evening as we kick off International Underground Railroad Month. So by a show of hands for you that are here, how many of you knew that September was International Underground Railroad Month? Few people, okay. So we understand that this is news for a lot of people uh, and, and for the general public at large. And so um, it's important to understand of how we got to uh, this point and to unpack that a little bit further. Uh, September represents International Underground Railroad Month. In 2019, the state of Maryland proclaimed September as International Underground Railroad Month. And in 2020, the states, Maryland and Michigan, were trailblazers in the effort to include more states in this celebration. On June 14th, 2022, just this year, Ohio House Bill th uh, 340 designated September as International Underground Railroad Month making Ohio the 12th state with a proclamation of this recognition. In conjunction with Ohio's inaugural year, we are hosting a range of initiatives beginning with this evening's program. If you go to our website, freedomcenter.org, you will see that we will have uh, a lot of programming taking place. We will have a lecture on September 16th with Phil Armstrong. Uh, on our community free days, we will have that Sunday on September 18th. That day would be dedicated uh, to underground railroad stories and underground railroad sites. And so that is an opportunity to come to get a lot of information uh, and, and to walk away with a greater understanding of the Underground Railroad. Uh, we will also have a film screening on the 19th of September. Uh, and so please go to our website, freedomcenter.org, to get details about those programs and more. Now, why September, right? Why September as International Underground Railroad Month? Well, September was chosen to represent the month because it was the month that two of the most well-known freedom seekers and Underground Railroad operatives, Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, escaped from slavery. Hence, it is extremely appropriate to hold this program, this opportunity, in the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center's Harriet Tubman Theater. And so we have a wonderful, wonderful panel um, that we will engage in discussion. So you didn't come to hear me speak uh, entirely, so I want to bring uh, this panel up. Uh, and so I would like to first uh, introduce uh, William Parrish, or Bill, as we <laughs> know him here in Cincinnati. He is the founder and executive director of the Eckstein Cultural Arts Center, established in 2016 in the historic village of Glendale, a suburb of Cincinnati, Ohio. Bill is a graduate of the Art Academy of Cincinnati with a BFA in communica uh, communication design. He was recently named the Distinguished Alumni for 2022 for his professional excellence as an artist, designer, and his commitment to community development. Most recently, Bill served as pastor of the West Cincinnati Presbyterian Church in Cincinnati until 2019 when he decided to devote his full-time effort to being a histor an historian, a researcher, and focus on the development of the Eckstein Cultural Arts Center. Can we give Bill Parrish a round of applause as he joins us? Our other panelist comes all the way from Mississippi, <laughs> Dr. Christy Hyman. She's an associate professor of human geography in the Department of Geosciences at Mississippi State University with a joint appointment in the program of African-American studies. Her research focuses on African-American efforts toward cultural and political assertion in the southeastern United States region during the antebellum era, as well as the attendant social and environmental costs of human slash landscape resource exploitation. Hyman uses geography 
geographic information systems to observe to what extent digital cart uh, cartography in the in, uh, can inform us of the human experience while acknowledging the phenomenon deriving from the oppressive systems in society threatening sustainable futures. Her research seeks to provide evidence of the genealogies and the practices of historic, uh, historically marginalized peoples nav uh, navigational literacy, relying on foundational black geographies, scholarships, Hyman research is Hyman's research is also theoretically rooted in black feminist theory, critical geography, geographies of transport and landscape studies. Can we give Dr. Christy Hyman a round of applause as she joins us on stage? Unfortunately, uh, Rita Thomas, who is a local historian um, and also the uh, LMS administrator at Central State University was unable to join us um, here this evening. And so I am glad to join us for this conversation. A uh, longstanding colleague of mine, um, and when we talk about the Underground Railroad, uh, she has been at the forefront of educating our children um, to educating uh, children not only here in the region, but abroad. Um, she is our manager of educational outreach. Um, she's been here with the institution for more than 17 years, starting out as a historical reenactor, um, telling stories. Uh, I can't think of how many personas she has taken over her time here, um, but she is passionate, passionate about our history, uh, passionate about making sure we have an understanding of the complete, truthful history. Uh, and so uh, she will be filling in to join us today, and that is Novella Nemo. Now, I will say this, um, if you, we will be taking questions and comments. Um, we have note cards um, and pens. And so if you feel compelled to write down a question or a comment, uh, please just lift your hand uh, and we'll be sure that one of our staff will get to you so that we can read your comment or your question so we can answer that accordingly. And so we're gonna kick off International Underground Railroad Month. So I'm gonna begin this question uh, with Christy, if you don't mind. Um, what does the Underground Railroad mean to you and how does it challenge or inspire you personally? Well, for me, uh, as a historical geographer, it is about uh, survival, it is about uh, love, and it is about perseverance. Because for enslaved freedom seekers, there were numerous, there were numerous environmental convergences that arose in areas that could have been potential sites of refuge and reconnaissance. These intersections of these paths in terms of social, political, and economic costs of escape into the wilderness are not always readily attended to when we think about and try to reimagine what they went through. Interspecies encounters, which we talked about earlier today, transformed into interspecies cooperation for those liberation seekers who develop a committed yearning to survive. It was the way to freedom. The way is a metaphor for the mysteries, the possibilities, the yearnings, and the receivings of surviving turbulent terrain in search of freedom. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Bill, same question for you. What does the Underground Railroad mean to you? Well, it means that we, um, for us as a people, I can speak from that personally um, to kind of translate some of that. Um, I know this past week, I just got back from Bullock County, uh, if, near Savannah, Georgia, which is where my family originated. Um, and I, the connection to that was powerful to be on the plantation where my family was for the first time. Uh, 
300 years of history. And so I, I could very easily tell you what I think about that in terms of history, but now personally, I can tell you <laughs> how I feel about that. Uh, my, my family originated before uh, 400 years ago, but in 1808, my great-great-great-grandfather, Cain Parrish, who was mulatto, uh, came about, which became sort of the, the platform for our family. Uh, after that, my, uh, we became free slaves who owned property. So my family today owns the land that we were, uh, that was our plantation. Uh, so I think before that, though, I think we were in a place where you were attempting to get some sort of humanity, uh, a feeling that you mattered, um, a feeling that education, all those things that we take for granted somewhat today, it weren't afforded. So I got to this past weekend to experience um, how we got that education. <laughs> uh, we started a school in 1874, which uh, a 15-year-old named Georgetta, uh, Georgiana Riggs, uh, 15 years old, she was the first teacher. So I, I'd like to sort of take that approach to that question because uh, as much as I've researched and as much as I know, I now know sort of the personal story of that struggle for freedom, the one that we're still fighting today. Thank you. And, and, and for Novella, uh, I, I ask the same question, but I want to also ask, um, can you talk a little bit about what start, started your journey into telling these critical stories that align with the Underground Railroad. So what it means to you and what was the, the, the motivation for you uh, to, to, to do this work? Well, the motivation was me that I lived in an area called Springboro, Ohio. And I moved there about 26 years ago. And I had two young sons, one was five and one was six, and I was just driving around heading downtown and I noticed that it was blocked off and I saw all these people running and I was like, what in the world is going on? So we got out of the car and we realized a festival was going on and it said something about the Underground Railroad. Now when I moved to Springboro, there were about two African-American families there. So when they saw me, uh, the person that was in charge of the Springboro Historical Society, Helen Sproke, she I mean, immediately ran to us and said, oh, I am so glad to see you. And we were like looking at her and she says, "We're, uh, do you live here? Are you around from here? And we said, yeah, we just moved in Springboro. She said, oh, we are looking for somebody to portray runaway slaves. That was before they started saying enslaved and stuff like that. And my first thought, I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> and so she had asked my husband uh, at the time if he would like to do that, and he had a fused ankle, and so he said, no, I can't. And so then she looked at me, and I was like, no, I don't think so. And so my son, who was six years old, he looked up at me, and he was like, mommy, how come you tell me to stand up for things that are right, and you won't? My first thought was, boy, if you don't shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, but you, you keep telling me and you won't stand up. I was like, yeah, okay, we'll talk about that later, you know, trying to get him to be quiet. And he was just looking up at me and I was like, okay. And so she said, well, why don't you just think about it? And I was like, okay, thinking that, yeah, I'm going to think about this. Yeah, right. I'm from Virginia, um, very segregated. Uh, when I went to school, and when I ended up going to high school, they integrated, and we were so far behind that it kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. And my family was enslaved, but nobody in the family would talk about it. And so I was kind of, in a way, ashamed. And every time I would think about what was done to me in Virginia, I would get upset and cry. But to make a long story short, 
I couldn't sleep. And so I said to myself, oh, this is only once a year. I think I can do that, betray, betray somebody once a year. And I called Helen. I said, okay, I think I can do this once a year. And she said, oh, that's not what I want for you. She said, something in my spirit tells me that you can tell a story. And I was like, oh, lady, you just don't know. That's not me. She said, yeah, I think so. She says, I feel that. And she says, why don't you tell your story? And I said, my story. And she says, didn't you have family that was enslaved? And I said, yes. She said, why don't you tell that story? And I was like, I don't want to, didn't want to tell her I didn't know that story. And I just said, oh, OK, let me think about that. I had an Aunt Mary that was 99 at the time, and I called her. And I said, can you tell me anything about my great-grandmother who was enslaved? And she said, yeah, well, you know, Mama didn't talk about her a lot. But I can tell you she was free when she was 13. And her name was Charity. I had an Aunt Charity that was mean as a snake. I said, well, that won't be her name. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, that means that I had to come up with a story. And some reason, the story I came, I had, um, the character's name was Miss Sadie. But Miss Sadie was because her mother was from Africa, Nigeria, Africa. I don't know where Nigeria came from, but that was the story that I wrote. But I had prayed to God. And I said, if this is something that you really want me to do, then you give me the story. And I wrote this story within 30 minutes. And so I knew it was something that I needed to do. And I started telling the story. And everybody was like, oh my gosh. And so the Freedom Center was opening up. And um, the um, education department came down to Springboro. And they heard me perform. And they said, well, when we open up, can you come and do that for a weekend? And I said, sure. And uh, I came. And then they said, well, can you come back next weekend? I was working a full-time job, working for the city of Springboro. In the, uh, and I said, uh, OK, I can come back next weekend. And then they said, well, can you come back again next weekend? I'm like, um, I cannot work seven days a week. <laughs> you know, I have two kids. When is my last weekend? They said, well, we want you to continue to come here. And I was like, I live in Springboro, Ohio. It's 45 minutes away. I don't think I want to do that drive. And they convinced me. And that was 17 years ago. <laughs> and I tell you that this place, I went through a healing. And then I realized how important the story is that we didn't tell. It needs to be told. To me, the Underground Railroad is a secret, but that secret should be out. It shouldn't be over 400 years. And why are we so afraid of telling about that secret? The Underground Railroad is anybody helping somebody else to be free. Everything that, when we left Africa, they took everything about us away our name, our culture, who we were. And there's a lot of us still trying to figure out who we are. And I think when we talk about the Underground Railroad, we give all of those that are in my age group and older a chance to heal. But we also let our kids know what happened in America. We need to keep telling the story. We don't need to keep it a secret. So for me, the Underground Railroad was a secret. And now the secret is out. And what are we going to do with it? We're going to stand up, and we're going to keep telling the story. And we're going to shout it from the mountaintops, the story that needs to be told. That's what the Underground Railroad means to me. feel like I need to say amen on that one. <laughs> um, and so, I, I, Christy, I would like to uh, come to you with this uh, next follow-up question. Um, you know, for me, Underground Railroad, there are these amazing stories that, that pop up in these uh, historical people that are heroes, sheroes. 
Um, you know, I have my own, you know, the, the story of uh, uh, Samuel Burris is one of those lesser known stories that I really do appreciate. Um, it takes place in Delaware. Uh, he's a man, a black man who's born in freedom, but yet he uses his privilege and access to help those who are in search of freedom. Uh, and he almost pays the ultimate price uh, by being enslaved after uh, he is caught helping a woman to freedom. Um, but he had a group of friends that helped him out of that situation uh, to maintain his freedom. And so my question is, uh, uh, is there a particular Underground Railroad story or person um, that you feel that you connect with and that may or may not get enough recognition? recognition? Yes, that's a really, that is a really uh, important question to think about the people in history who have not been discussed and had their efforts amplified appropriately for the role they played in the Underground Railroad. I have to say that, there, like, like you're saying, uh, Chris, there are people like Harriet Tubman, there are people like Frederick Douglass, uh, there are print editions of William Wells Brown's uh, text, and then there are print editions of uh, 12 Years a Slave. There are so many narratives of enslavement that have been printed, some written by the enslaved person themselves, some written by an amanuensis, which is to say the person who took down the enslaved person's testimony because they were denied the opportunity to learn to read and write, like Moses Grandy out of, uh, out of Camden County, North Carolina, near Virginia, where you were from. And in those stories, if you read those stories, you will actually, if you read between the lines, they are telling you about the Underground Railroad. Moses Grandy is telling you about the Underground Railroad when he's telling about his sister Tamar who found a way to escape from a slave coffle from Virginia all the way to Georgia by running away 150 miles back to the Great Dismal Swamp. He's telling you about the Underground Railroad when they had wood that they would place under their feet so as to not leave footprint tracks. They're telling you about the Underground Railroad when they tell you to leave out onions because upon your life, wipe the onions on your feet so the scent hounds cannot track you. So I would say of the most forgotten Underground Railroad person for me would be every elderly enslaved person who held so many years of navigation and journeys from all of the places that they had been sold to and from, from all of the places their children and grandchildren had been sold to and from, to the ladies who, because they were so old, they did not have a value attached to them so that their movements were not watched so closely that they could hide runaway slaves in the floorboards of their cabins. There's something that you said, I, I want to make sure that we get an understanding. You talked about the wood underneath the feet to not leave a, a, a footprint. You talked about the wild onions and, and covering the scent. I, I think it's very important when we talk about the Underground Railroad, we do not diminish the creativity and the intelligence of people striving to obtain their freedom. I think that is very, very important that we have that understanding. And so that's what that, that sticks out to me when you were giving your those accounts of that. Um, and I'm not quite sure if, you know, if there's anything, it's not a question, but it's just something that struck me while you were speaking, uh, you know, about that. Um, and, and Bill, I don't know if you want to either, if there's a story that is of great significance or even to co continue this conversation about the creativity and the innovation uh, of, of freedom seekers, uh, of people striving to get to freedom. Is there anything that stands out to you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, most of my thinking and most of the work that I've done as a historian has been local. 
because I think that uh, there are some really big people that are totally under the radar of the Underground Railroad, uh, uh, specific to the village of Glendale. Um, there's, there's two African Americans that were huge uh, that many of us may or may not know. Uh, they were pastors. Uh, one was Wallace Shelton, who was uh, part of the Underground Railroad that originated north of us in Springfield. Uh, he came back, he came to Cincinnati between, behind Nichols, who was the first black pastor in the state of Ohio. Wallace Shelton came behind him and he planted Zion Missionary Baptist Church, but then he planted churches throughout the north, including the one in Glendale, the one that's now in uh, Woodlawn that was in Lachlan, and um, in uh, Carthage, on, on through there. So I think there, these pastors, leaders were part of this network. They were planting these churches that where information was being plant, was being shared and where people were being harbored in, in many ways. Uh, and then there's Benjamin Arnett, who wrote the Black Laws, who was responsible for that, pushing that. Uh, he planted another church in, in this 1.7 mile of a village called Glendale. Uh, it was uh, Quinn Chapel AME Church, which is now in, in Forest Park. And so these two guys were major leaders in this movement. Um, I want to say, uh, that they were huge uh, for the black community because they were the ones who made sure that in furthering education, that was a really big deal, even for kids who were moving, uh, families that were moving north. So those two African Americans are, are not really mentioned, uh, but are really significant to the village of Glendale, which was a central station for the Underground Railroad. Um, what was really interesting today was uh, meeting Novella and finding out that she was uh, Springboro. She's <laughs> from Springboro, and Springboro was the next stop, uh, next central station from Glendale on the Underground Railroad. So you hear these stories of maybe about John Van Zant, um, the uh, Lyman, and Harriet Beecher. Uh, so they lived in Glendale. Uh, this, this whole narrative, in many ways, makes you sometimes feel like, well, gosh, this, did the Civil War start here? Like, uh, for me, that's sort of a conclusion that I kind of came to because all of the central characters in this Underground Railroad movement were in Glendale at, at some point. Um, I think it's important to note also that um, uh, in and a lot of this research, it takes you out of your, out of the uh, African-American sort of a state of research. And I found once I got outside of that, I realized that the Europeans played a huge role in this, including um, John Chapman, who was uh, Johnny Appleseed. Um, he was in Glendale. Uh, he was a Swedenborgian. So for those of us who know, kind of know the Swedenborgian church and how it came from Europe and established itself in Cincinnati and the people who came out of that. Uh, the main central station leaders, uh, the Allen family, Sam Allen and uh, Marston Allen, those people, they were Swedenborgians. They were totally against slavery. So they came here from Europe to fight this fight. So I think there's some characters underneath this narrative that uh, that aren't African American, but are people who came with a heart, you know, a faith, and saying, "Hey, we're we're not happy with this, and we're going to we're going to fight it." Uh, another such person is Frederick Eckstein, who um, who came. They came from Europe, and he was named the father of Cincinnati art when he first came here. He started the art center, and he did all of this work. But they were in Glendale. So these were all central characters. I mean, we got Stanley Matthews, we got um, uh, the Proctors, we got uh, the uh, Lyman Beecher, and we got Harriet Beecher. Um, we got John Van Zant, who is most famous for uh, helping the saved slaves and the, and the Liza House, which was also in Glendale. So I, I think it's important to share this 
from that narrative of the people outside of the African American community who were equally as passionate about abolishing slavery and doing things to, to fight against it. Um, and sometimes that gets lost that it was a it was a real effort and I really in my own studies have found that um, especially like in Glendale we have there was three sources for escaping slaves. One, they had tunnels, um, hiding places as well. We had the train station that went through the middle of the village. And then just on the other side of that, we had the Erie Canal. So there wasn't, you know, this was a, a real plan. These were brilliant people who came together. It wasn't random in many ways. It was a plan of different groups of people who came together, charted this out, charted paths, and the people who were responsible for that, uh, most of them un are unlikely heroes. But the two I really want to point out were African Americans, uh, mainly because our structures are being destroyed and our narrative is being written out of this. So I, I want to help us to understand that preservation wasn't designed for us. Uh, and so our structures are not really important as it in the American landscape. Um, they're expendable, so they're, they're being torn down. Meanwhile, uh, we're not writing the stories quickly enough to keep the narrative going, and the narrative is gonna change. It's changing right now. We're not very aware of some of what's happening, but I think, um, for me, those are a few of the people mm -hmm. that are uh, significant to me. I can't, I really couldn't name one because I see so many hero, so many heroes in this story <laughs> that are unlikely ambassadors for something that uh, they're called to do. Now, I will say that, uh, what are the name of the two pastors that you mentioned? Uh, you said Pastor Shelton? Wallace Shelton, who was the pastor of Union Baptist Church, mm -hmm. which right now they're trying to, uh, we're, um, Saving the Graveyard of the mm -hmm. Union Baptists. Um, Wallace uh, Shelton planted all these churches from, from Springfield through Cincinnati, up through Glendale, and going north. And Benjamin Arnett, who was in the AME church, he was huge, but people didn't see him as a pastor and a, and a leader. They saw him on the steps of Columbus arguing the black laws, but he was a, he was a pastor. He, he, he um, was responsible for Brown AME Church, um, Allen Temple AME Churches. So these AME churches that run through our city and run north all the way up to Dayton and Springfield, are, these two guys are responsible for a lot of that. So, mm -hmm. so that's history in terms of the network of how um, this Underground Railroad worked. It wasn't just about people scurrying through the woods and and trying to find safe places. It was, this was intelligence, this was planning. These were people who actually, it was strategy uh, behind it. it. A lot of it wasn't random. Thank you. Um, definitely, uh, Pastor Wallace Sheldon, Benjamin Arnett. For those of us that live in Cincinnati, uh, you know, this could be a little bit of homework for us during this month, right? Get to know these individuals a little bit closer. Uh, get, Wallace Shelton was on a uh, Bar Street. He lived on Bar Street down down here, and there would just happened to be a tributary of the um, Erie Canal that ran behind his house. <laughs> <laughs> and um, thank you, thank you for that, Bill. And you mentioned John Van Zant. Uh, I was made aware of that story through Carl Westmoreland, um, uh, our senior historian, who unfortunately we. We, we lost this past March, uh, but he was an advocate uh, for uh, getting John Van Zandt re-admitted uh, into the church posthumously because he was kicked out of the church uh, for doing the work on the Underground Railroad, being a conductor. Uh, and so, yeah. a very significant story. Very. Uh, Joyce Coleman played a huge role in, in that as well. They were the ones who put me on. I took over. Uh, for them to get the rest of that story that's developed. Um, actually, I just met uh, last year uh, the four-time great-grand 
daughter of John Van Zandt. And so we've had these amazing conversations uh, of, about that, that history of her family and that. And I think updating the Underground Railroad is really important that the generations, as we need to learn this history, no matter how painful it is, we need to learn it so that we can better understand how to communicate that to this next generation that, that's coming. Because if we don't figure this out, then the stories do end. They end and we can't, there's not much, as long as we keep the stories going and adding new people who are under the radar, if we keep adding those stories to it, then we can get a better complete understanding of the families that were involved uh, and help our kids to better understand uh, why things are the way they are. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and so as we continue to unpack the Underground Railroad, just make a note, if you have a question or comment, please, um, you know, we, we look forward to those questions or comments. If you don't have a note card, you can raise your hand and we'll be sure to get a note card to you uh, so that you can write down your question or your comment. And so Novella, um, as we continue to unpack the Underground Railroad um, and, and, and continuing to highlight stories. So over your time period um, doing this work, uh, is there been a story that you have come across, the Underground Railroad story, uh, that really stood out to you? Something that may be lesser known to the public at large? Um, several stories stand out to me. Um, as I do my research, as we know, mostly uh, young men ran, but I found out there were a lot of women that were running also even though they had children, so Margaret Ward. Um, my favorite person was of all that when I get to heaven, thank you, Lord, uh, I want to meet Miss Sojourner Truth. <laughs> she is one person that I could say um, her attitude, uh, even when she said that when she left, she says, oh, I did not run but that would have been improper. I just kindly walked away. I'm like, okay, woman, you bad. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, stories like that, Margaret Ward, uh, her son ended up being, um, Oh, yeah, Samuel Ringwald. Samuel Ringwald Ward, uh, one of the biggest abolitionists up in New York. So her story, she didn't tell a lot about her story, so I'm, I'm still doing some research on her. Margaret Garner, I mean, her story is tragic, but, uh, and most people call her mad, but she was desperate, and, and her story needs to be told in a way of truth, because I believe the reason why she uh, did what she did is because of her life and her mother's life, and she saw her girls uh, life being that way. And if you don't know Margaret's Garner story, please look it up. Um, biggest trial in Cincinnati history uh, because she left uh, Maysville, Kentucky, and she came over here into Bucktown looking for uh, freedom, and she got caught, and she realized that she wasn't going back. And so she took her first child, Mary, who was a baby, and she cut her throat. And then she went after the second child, Priscilla. And, and everybody said, oh, she was crazy. No. Margaret's mother was listed in the census as being black, which means she was dark-skinned. Margaret was listed, her father was listed as black. He was dark-skinned. But Margaret was listed as mulatto. That means she, her mother was raped. Margaret was was married to Robert, but Robert was hired out in Covington. And every time he came back home, Margaret ended up being pregnant. It wasn't his child. But when he left, he took all the kids with him. And so when Margaret decided to kill Mary and go after Priscilla, she did that for a reason. Because she knew what they did to her mother and what they did to her, they would eventually do to her daughters. And she didn't want to see that done. So that's why she went after those girls first instead of the boys. So these are stories of not madness, but I'm going to get my freedom either by life 
or by death, because if I die, I'm going to be free too. So these are stories that I'm interested in. Um, Eliza Harris crossing the river, a frozen, not even a frozen river, but jumping over ice flows with a baby. She was uh, rescued by Van Zandt. I mean, so I'm looking at stories that we don't know about, but stories that we do know about that we need to still tell. So all of my stories that I'm really interested in is the stories of the ladies that ran. Those are my most interesting stories because not only did they run for their freedom, but they had to be very, very strong because some of them took their babies with them, and that was unheard of. And, of course, Miss Harriet Tubman. I mean, this woman not only took people, she took children, and she took a crowd with her. Didn't matter. And when she would pass out, people would just sit there and wait for her to wake up. I mean, that was their chance to leave because she threatened them. You, you leave, you die. So you passed out. Maybe I can leave, but they stayed there. So they had that faith in her. So, you know, my thing is that God works in mysterious ways. And he has raised up a lot of people to tell the stories, to get their freedom. And so the story continues. And that's why we are here, to can keep the stories going on, to tell the stories that we don't know about, to do the research, to find those stories, and to keep telling them so that maybe America could finally be what it says it was always supposed to be, the land of the free, the home of the brave. But how can you sing that song when we still see what's going on in America? How can we say America is free? We can say it by telling the stories and maybe hoping one day people's eyes will be open and they say enough is enough and we are finally free. So I want to talk a little bit about health and wellness within this conversation um, because what a lot is said is that, you know, these stories are can be traumatic. Um, these stories... Uh, may um, be violent in many ways. Um, and so when we start to unpack, you know, the authentic reality of this time period of the Underground Railroad, um, you know, but how can these stories actually help be healthy and, and, and make us well by having this understanding? And so, um, so my question is, you know, what are your thoughts about unpacking this history for the purpose of greater health and greater wellness? I'm going to begin with you, Christy. Okay, so I'm going to approach this question um, in three parts. The first part is uh, just a small reminder that uh, in the 18th century, that is to say the 1700s, uh, there were philosophers, uh, well-respected philosophers, who had ideas about racial difference. And most of these ideas about racial difference were solely based on the appearance of enslaved captives from Africa. Because enslaved captives, their skin color was so dark, and because of where they were geographically located near, uh, as they called it, the torrid zone, they were believed as naturally fitted for slavery. So not only are these learned people believing that black people are subhuman, they are also writing these treatises that are part of a discourse that proliferates during the time period. The other learned men who become heads of state, who become legislators, what they are reading and how they are choosing to view black people. So, if in the 1700s the there were ideologies about racial difference, by the 1800s, once domestic slavery had pretty much taken hold in the United States and the antebellum South, the dehumanization that goes with enslaving a person and punishing a person and separating people from their uh, loved ones, it does, not, it does not enter as wrong. 
it does not enter as wrong because there were all these discourses about black people being subhuman to begin with. So once abolition comes on the scene, it takes a many different turns before it is finally recognized that black people should be free because they are people, not necessarily because we can teach them to become this or teach them to become that. Black people are free because they deserve to be free because they are our brothers and sisters. They are our people under God's kingdom. So in the realm of the Underground Railroad, if you read runaway slave ads, you will see that certain enslaved people who ran away were repeat offenders, as one would call it. One woman had all of her toes cut off in Louisiana. That is how the enslaver chose to identify her. If you see an enslaved woman missing all of her toes, that is her. So what does that say about her determination? What does that say about the institution of slavery and its degree of discipline and punishment? And what does that say about how another discourse is forming about black, how black people understand pain? So if we look today, this is the third part of this answer, Black people are not always believed that they're in pain when they say that they're in pain to their physicians. Black mothers are sadly dying of, at childbirth at alarming rates. Black children, rather than being seen as potentially possibly having a mental health condition, are tracked into behavioral systems within the school system that are part of the uh, school to prison pipeline. So they are there are antecedents historically that have, that have ushered in many realities that bring us to today that has to do with black health and wellness. And, and because of how health and wellness is now affecting everyone because of the outpouring of the pandemic, do we really look at this in a way that is more universalized rather than seen as within the black community uh, endemic uh, pathology, only specific to black people. That's powerful. That's a lot to think about, and I'm glad you walked us through those steps and to make it relevant. I do believe that it's important for us to make history relevant today. And as we continue to unpack, you draw those connections. Um, and so, Bill, you know, I will say that, you know, um, this year, 2022, uh, the black history theme for 2022, for those that don't know, is black health and wellness. That's why I asked that question to Christy. Um, for the next year, 2023, it's uh, black resistance. And so um, uh, where do you see in that, uh, when you talk about black resistance and you've talked about it a little bit, how do you see that shaping in the stories that you are starting to learn and reveal as it aligns with the Underground Railroad? That's a good question. I think uh, it's one, too. I think that the audience should really kind of hear. Uh, I think the Underground Railroad movement was the first real example of resistance. <laughs> so I think taking that example, um, I also would like to shoot back over to the point that Dr. Hyman made about um, just kind of a little diversion here um, about the trauma of the this experience of slavery. Um, I think trauma comes in many different forms, and I think you know if we look in our families, you know, and some of our families would say, "Well, you know, we got diabetes in our family." You know, it goes all the way back, you know, <laughs> or we got this in our family. And many times, you know, that's, that's all the health and wellness that we get in many ways is somebody in your family telling you that because back then and in many ways today, we didn't go to the doctor. You know, we didn't get somebody to diagnose that we had mental health issues, you know, that were brought on by certain things. So those things generationally, gets passed down in our families. And then it finally comes to the point where you do get health care and you go to the doctor regularly enough that he can manage what's already generationally been established. 
So I saw some of that in my, in my own family, but I also still want to, if I can, just sort of address um, how health and wellness has really played a huge role in, the, in us and developing because I think the trauma of the Underground Railroad and it, it gets passed on. So in many ways, it's like a generational curse in our lives. We don't, we don't get to a point where we address it so it gets passed to the next generation. Uh, what I'm hoping and where I spend a lot of time outside of researching is uh, having discussion groups where we discuss uh, things about race. And I have a number of people in our, my group that have kind of come to a point where they can reconcile. Hopefully this is the journey as we talk about these things that the goal is actually how do we reconcile this history and then uh, get to the point where there's a process by which we can reconcile the past because our history is laden with health and wellness issues that just come from trauma, you know? And um, so I think part of my solution is not just to research and to provide um, this information to give to people that I've discovered, but it's to have the discussion the back and forth, you know, what do you think about this? Uh, what do you think about that? And what do you think about 150 years ago that this happened, you know? Um, and, and then through that dialogue, we arrive somewhere where we both can be transparent about what happened and whether it was your great, great, great grandfather that did it or whatever happened that you can come to that point to be able to reconcile that. And then that's when the real conversation begins, is when we can begin to admit that this really did happen. Up until that point, it's just a discussion about events that we know happened and that other groups of people are in denial of. But our health and wellness is not going to really improve, in my own personal opinion, until we're able to address these traumas that are still uh, every day we, we face. And so part of my solution is that is discussion. I mean, it, we can't get away from stuff like this. I do them in, in small groups. I mean, a couple of my people, a part of those groups are here. We, we talk about this stuff. We have the difficult conversation. And that's what I think, you know, beyond talking about this, we actually have to do something, small things, like be able to develop a dialogue have difficult conversations where you disagree completely, but you stay in there, you keep talking about it, because ultimately you want to get to begin a healing process. And so all of this for me, you know, discussions and, and this is, I'm always thinking, okay, what do we do next? How do we, how do we move the ball down the field a little further in helping people to connect with this atrocity of slavery that for a group of people who are still trying to, to live out of that and come to grips with, with their hist a history that was forced upon them. Thank you, thank you. I'm just gonna see if we have any questions, uh, possibly for, yeah, we have one. Okay, if you do have questions, please raise your hand um, and we'll be sure to get a car from you. Uh, this question, I believe, is for Bill. Um, you mentioned that the narrative is changing. In what ways is the narrative changing? Well, when I use narrative, um, it's kind of a broad, it's kind of a broad word to use, but I, I'd like to say more specifically as I look at the Underground Railroad and the history that speak to that in as far as preservation is concerned. Uh, preservation wasn't designed for us. And so I think uh, white America sees, it's just a part of what it does to save, whether it's, it's his structure, the history and all of those things. But 
there's not real value seen in the structures of our of African Americans. It's not a real, uh, you know, those things can easily be well. There's it's something wrong with it, so we tear it down. And so, what I've watched take place over the at least the last four years in this city is how many structures in the African American community, significant historical structures that have been torn down. Now, there's a there's a collaborative that's going on right now between um, Cincinnati Preservation and uh, Washington, where we are identifying black structures that we're going to save. The goal has started out to be 25. That's an intentional thing that we're, we're doing. Um, I said, uh, I associated narrative with that because when you tear down our structures, they're gone because in most cases, we don't have the, the oral or the written history to support that. So they're gone and there's no way to recover that because largely the people who would be responsible for that are gone as well to tell those stories. So I say the narrative is because our, our story is being told less and less and largely it's because um, preservation wasn't designed for us. So we were trying to, the solution after we discussed this and said, wow, this is happening, then we came up with an intentional process by which to save these structures and it has to be, okay, we're gonna do this. We're gonna start with 25 because that's the only way we can wrap our, our arms around uh, the narrative. Our stories are wrapped up in our houses and our churches the same way your, your stories are wrapped up in generations of living in the same house. In most cases in our families, we've lived in a house for maybe one or two generations it's not, it's rare you're gonna find a lot of black people in this city that have lived in their, the same house for three generations or more. So that narrative is what I'm really concerned about that we, that we are taking action towards with the support of Cincinnati Preservation Association. Does that answer your question or did you? Okay. Thank you, thank you for your question and thank you for your response, Bill. Um, I think this one might be for Christy, I assume, although the name isn't touched, but I see the word geography, so I, <laughs> that's why I come to that conclusion. It says, how does um, indigenous uh, culture and history fit into modern day ownership? Um, as black people go to gain equity through geography, what about uh, the natives? How do we include them? Well, that's a, a complex uh, question um, that people are often faced with. Uh, but first, I'll preface, uh, when it comes to indigenous communities, uh, there, there are several layers of experiences that they have that are completely complex across the North American landmass. Um, so there is no pan-indigeneity as we know it, each tribe tries for their own individual sovereignty in different ways. Um, you have Pawnee, you have Ponca, you have uh, Cherokee, you have, you have uh, Haluasaponi, you have Nansaman, you have Croatan, you have so many different uh, indigenous communities across the United States who have been oppressed and dispossessed of their land in various ways over various time scales. Um, and those things did not always happen alongside the uh, addition and the expansion of slavery in the United States. They, they were happening at varying timescales and different geographies. So when it comes to uh, the state that I know a lot about, uh, North Carolina, which is where I'm from, um, you have to look at the dispos you have to look at the arrival of English colonists. English colonists got there around 16, uh, 1600s. Um, the first Africans got there about 1619, but the actual domestic slave market didn't start to expand until about after uh, the, the 1820s. So what you're looking at is a dispossession and encroachment of English colonists on indigenous communities in the southeast portion of the United States happening far before uh, African Americans are having enough children in slavery that you can say the enslavement uh, society has really uh, animated itself. 
to that end, the realities are not the same and the realities cannot be conflated. Uh, American Indians were not even recognized as a racial category uh, for many, many years, almost up until the 20th century. And the reason for that was because they were afraid that there were black people who had intermarried with indigenous people who would say that they were Indians and then they would go free. So you have two very different realities, two very different types of oppression, varying complexities of when they were oppressed and where they were oppressed alongside complex realities of different states and different territories and how they were attending to how they were going to oppress that makes it very hard for, uh, for us to just have like a neat answer for that type of thing. But what I've been seeing with uh, uh, land activists and with uh, various activists as far as food justice and things, that they are recognizing that the land that they are on, even as black people who were enslaved, are, is land that has been dispossessed and were, and were encroached upon by uh, various colonists. So in that acknowledgement and in trying to uh, have conversations with local indigenous communities who were original ancestral stewards of that land, that is a way for them to be attendant to, uh, to the conversations about land sovereignty, land back, uh, and going back to the land. And I would say, to go back to the resistance question, a lot of black people, especially young black people, are resisting by getting out of the system, by owning the means of production, by not becoming part of the corporate world, trying to find land, trying to steward the land as indigenous people would have wanted it to be stewarded and living off on their own and just basically cutting themselves out of the modern world. That's what a lot of, uh, that's what a lot of young African Americans are doing because they, they're seeing the limit, the limitations of the political process, and they're seeing the limitations of what would be considered uh, an anarchic process. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to take a couple more uh, questions here from the note card. Um, I'm going to have Novella. I'm going to have you respond to this question. Um, this time permitted, I think I want to respond to as well. I think it is good. And anyone on the panel, I, I would say after Novella, if you want to chime in, that would be outstanding. Uh, can you speak to the coverage of the Underground Railroad and slavery in the press, music, books, art during those early years? And I, I'm assuming the question meaning that antebellum period uh, during the, the 19th century. Uh, what were the critical works that helped tell the truth? Now, so I think they're talking about primary documents. So you have to you have to look at the uh, the narratives of enslavement. William Wells Brown um, and William Steele. William Steele's uh, text talks about the Underground Railroad. He talks about uh, abolitionists, white abolitionists, and black abolitionists who lost their lives uh, in the Underground Railroad. Um, you also have uh, you also have the unsung folks like you've been pointing out. When we talk about truth, uh, truth is such a subjective word because where an, enslaved, where an enslaved person saw freedom and liberation, an enslaver, a plantation owner saw you stole yourself from my property. So we got two different ideologies going at the same time that are both considered true. So when it comes to reading, whether you're reading William Steele, where you, whether you're reading a pro-slavery rhetorician like um, Edmund Ruffin uh, or George Fitzhugh or uh, any narrative of enslavement, truth is going to have to occur within your own uh, subjective interpretive lens based on what you have encountered, based on your own depth of experience, and based on how much you want to do with the information you're learning and how you're gonna carry it forward, you know? But in terms of actual sources, Doc South through UNC Chapel Hill yes. has 
a complete compendium of North American slave narratives. So you can read North American slave narratives. You can also read uh, Southern narratives written by pro-slavery rhetoricians. And I say read them too. And the reason I say it is because a lot of them were agronomists. And in agronomy, they're talking about how these work regimes work on these plantations. They're trying to run these orderly plantations. And in reading about how they believe an orderly plantation should occur, you're finding out the day-to-day -day happenings of enslaved people and how they were expected to order themselves around a punitive landscape. So the, the, it's out there. Most of the stuff is out there and digitized. But then you have to go to Eckstein and you have to come here and get these museum, uh, the museum and the, uh, material, uh, the material elements of this culture and bring it all together and decide for yourself. I, I, I just also want say the hand-me-down yeah. stories. There are a lot of stories that mm -hmm. your family told you that you don't talk about mm -hmm. um, that needs to be told too. Um, so that, that's consideration. Mm -hmm. You're referring to the uh, oral the oral, the oral, the oral stories yeah, when I say hand-me-down stories. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I just want to, uh, uh, Christy brought up uh, documenting the South. Uh, which is a database with the University of North Carolina. Um, that was an integral um, database for me in my journey here. Um, and so we're talking about the Underground Railroad. By a show of hands, how many of you ever heard of a man named Jermaine Wesley Logan? <laughs> All right. So you never heard of him before. Now, I'm going to help you out. His last name is spelled L-O-G-U-E-N. And why I always find that fascinating is because he is the only man with the moniker and title of King of the Underground Railroad. It is in documentation. It is in subscriptions. It's in publications. It's not that hard to find. Uh, I discovered an article in, that was written in July of 1865. Why is that important? Because that is uh, a few months after the ending of the Civil War. Uh, and it said, Reverend J.W. Logan, King of the Underground Railroad, returns to Davidson County, Tennessee, which is outside of Nashville, right there in Nashville, Tennessee, and he was reunited with his mother. I thought that was a beautiful story a reunion between a son and mother. But what stood out, I was like, king of the Underground Railroad. And it was the documenting the South where he wrote his own um, story about how not only he was enslaved, but how his mother was enslaved. And quite interestingly enough, his mother was born free here in this territory that will become Ohio. She was free, but she was kidnapped sold in Kentucky on the side of the road like a piece of fruit, and her children, including Jermaine, as well as his brother and sister, were then deemed with the mark of being enslaved until he liberated himself in 1834. Uh, and so these are these wonderful stories that can inspire us, that can challenge us. Uh, and so there's many publications um, in documenting the South, and I'm glad you mentioned that is an outstanding resource uh, there at the University of North Carolina. Um, and so I'm going to take, uh, I'm, doing time. I'm going to take uh, one more question. Um, I, I think I can, how often are your discussions and, uh, are, and can they be public, public for more of these? Uh, how can the public hear about more of these? So as I said, freedomcenter.org, you can continue to go to our website. Uh, we will keep a rolling marquee of our upcoming programs. I would say please join us on September 16th. We will have a wonderful, wonderful lecture by Phil Armstrong. Um, and Phil is the interim director of the Greenwood Rising History Center. Have you ever heard of the story of Black Wall Street um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Uh, that, was, uh, uh, that was designed and architect by a first generation freeman, meaning that his parents were enslaved, uh, but he was the first of his generation to be born into freedom. You can come here and listen to that story. So we will continue to continue to bring uh, these discussions and these stories uh, to the public. 
Um, and for those that are not here, we are recording. And so there will be some snippets of this discussion here today too as well. So I hope that answers that question. Um, and so, let's see. Okay, I think this is a very good question. And anyone on the panel can answer this one uh, because it was big this year, extremely big. How do you view Juneteenth and its recognition as a national holiday? Because you have the work of the Underground Railroad, you have this war, Civil War, uh, and then you have this process of a liber liberation and freedom, and emancipation, and that hopefully eventually leads into this thing we call equality. <laughs> uh, and so what are your views on Juneteenth and it now being a national holiday? I, I can start with that probably. Um, my view when I first, when it first became reality, um, gosh, we talked about it in our group. I think some of the reality of it was that, okay, um, how do we educate people to accept it? It's sort of like, to me, it was like Dr. King's birthday. You know, <laughs> people didn't accept it even when it was official. How do you begin to get people to do it? So I, I kind of felt personally, I went to Springboro. We went to Springboro to celebrate, you know, with people who kind of understood what this meant, largely black and white people who were open and very easily able to interact with the, the whole idea. Uh, so I think the challenge to me is the challenge that we always have when something is perceived as black, you know, oh, another black holiday, oh, what we gonna do? You know, that kind of thing versus looking at the history and saying, you know, emancipation and, and what that meant and understanding. So. I think the education part of this is the biggest part for me. Like, I feel like I have to educate my white friends. You know, I want them to understand this. I want them to accept it on, on the terms that, that they need to accept it. I don't, I don't feel like it's important for me to force somebody to accept something, but I, I tend, we have discussions. <laughs> so it's about exchange of information and and for me, I found that that's the most effective way to uh, get people to, to see and understand what happened is to engage in a dialogue that's difficult in the beginning. You know, when you're trying to share with, you know, my white friends, I'm trying to share information with them now to the point where they kind of accept it, like, okay, read this and then let's, let's talk about it. And so, that's my own personal challenge with Juneteenth. That's huge. So I invite them to come to Springboro, or I say, come and just go do this and that. And then we're, they're uncomfortable, but after a couple of times, it's like, okay, this becomes, I mean, it's no way we can't be uncomfortable with accepting things like this. But to me, I'm not gonna give up on the idea that we gotta reconcile, we gotta be a better job of understanding and I've found that through difficult conversations is the best way for me and the people that I, I won't invite you into a difficult conversation and it not be a safe place to come in. You're not gonna come in and get flogged. You know, you're gonna be invited in and your opinion, no matter how different it may be, it's gonna be accepted because that exchange now is really important more than the fact that you need to know that Juneteenth is a holiday now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and forcing it to you. It's better when you understand we, through dialogue that why this is happening and why it's necessary right now. Uh, when Juneteenth oh. became um, a national holiday, the first thing that came into my mind was Frederick Douglass and his voice. What is the 4th of July to the Negro slave? And it's like, okay, we finally got our 4th of July, our freedom. That's what Juneteenth mean to me, that you're finally recognizing that this is when we could say that we were actually free and we could celebrate our freedom. I would just uh, 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 get 
people to look into the work of Andrea Roberts, who has something called the Texas Freedom Colonies uh, digital uh, space, and that can get you very much acclimated to the work uh, and the history of enslavement in the uh, in the in the Texas uh, territory. Um, as far as uh, holidays and commemorations are concerned, I always think that that is a very good thing. Uh, as I've observed, uh, some people feel like the commodification of Juneteenth by uh, certain retailers is a bit regrettable, but uh, for the most part, it is, is a, a step forward. But I do urge everyone to familiarize themselves with Dr. Andrea Roberts' work, uh, Texas Freedom Colonies. Thank you, Andrea Roberts, she said, absolutely. She's at, She's at UVA now, she was formerly at Texas A&M. Okay. I will let you know as a sidebar uh, historian, I would say Galveston, Texas historian Sam Collins um, is planning to actually visit our city in February um, to, to talk a little bit more um, intimately about Juneteenth uh, and about that origins in Galveston, um, Texas. Um, I just wanted to add in my, my, my two cents to this conversation because uh, for me, Juneteenth has really evolved. Um, I, it caused, I felt compelled to dive deeper into a greater understanding uh, about it. And what I find fascinating is that Americans, most Americans tend to love a good story about war. Think about how many monuments we have with generals and that deals with war. Look at all the movies that have been made about, you know, the glorification of war and these heroes that have come out of war. And Juneteenth is a story about a war dealing with a general and soldiers. And quite interestingly enough, black soldiers. Um, recently, I learned that the U.S. Colored Infantry, the 28th U.S. Colored Infantry, which was organized in all states in Indiana, was one of those troops that rolled into Galveston, Texas on June 19, 1865 with General Gordon Granger. I just found that out last month. So that tells me there's more to that story. And so, and so my feelings about Juneteenth, I look at it as an opportunity for us to have a greater understanding of our history, of our history. This is an American story that we deserve to know, have knowledge of, and to have greater understanding of. And so um, as we're gonna bring things to a close, I'm going to ask my panel if there's any last remarks that you would like to provide as we celebrate and acknowledge International Underground Railroad Month. And we'll begin with Christy, then Bill, and then Novella. Yes, I just want to remind everyone that as we think about the different, uh, the continuing resonances of the legacy of the Underground Railroad, that we always think of it in terms of the bonds of families that were torn asunder, that were able to be pursued, attempted to, or repaired as a result of a persistent, a persistent yearning for freedom. I think the Underground Railroad, um, the, the fact that it's the international, that it's an international holiday is very important because I think many times we tend to think that it was America that those of us who were here on this continent that, but there were many uh, who came from, from Europe and other places to, uh, because of their disdain for slavery. Um, I was thinking of George Bush, the original George Bush was against this stuff. He was a Swedenborgian. <laughs> so, I, you know, those sorts of stories that are hidden in there that we sort of classify people and say, well, they can't care anything about this or that. But I found that in my research that there are different people largely outside of the African-American race who, who made this happen because we were enslaved, so we couldn't do a lot of things. But 
the Europeans came in, the Swedenborgians, the um, uh, German, Irish, this uh, whole plethora of different groups of people who came to fight this cause. So in my final piece of this, all of this history for me is just to uh, create dialogue. We, we, gotta, we gotta do this dialogue thing. Uh, no matter how we talk about this, we, we have to have a face-to-face -face conversation. So I, I think uh, I have a group of people who we, we have these conversations. We've had them for two years now since the um, George Floyd um, killing uh, compelled us that we, we can't talk about this anymore. We have to do something. So we intentionally brought groups of black, white, male, female together and we, we're still having these difficult conversations with one thing in mind that we must do something. So we have a list of things that we, we uh, have to do. They don't have to be big things, but they're little things and big things come out of them and they have, but the, the idea is that why we can't continue to have these conversations and then not be intentional about how do we come together to give to educate each other, and on top of that, now do something to reconcile the past. Otherwise, it's all in vain if we don't begin to understand this, this history and be able to talk about it and then be able to come to grips with the sorrow that is associated. And then um, ask for forgiveness for it or whatever your process may be so that we can begin, we can't begin to heal the heal until we begin to recognize that we got to have the conversation first, whether it's in your family that your, your great grandfather was a slave owner and that all just got passed to you and now you have this generational curse that you didn't even know you had and now you're asking to, you're, you're trying to free your grandfather, <laughs> you know, as you're freeing yourself. So the conversation, I guess, for me in a nutshell, why, why this is all important uh, to me is that uh, how do we reconcile? And that, that's always a recurring question uh, to me. And I realized that we can't without a dialogue, not me telling you, but a, a response from you and trying to understand, ask questions, whatever. So that's the huge part for me in this whole process of why it has to be international why the International Underground Railroad is so important because of all of the people who are involved, not just one people. I have to agree with Bill. Um, I mean, the International Underground is uh, another form of way that we in America can heal. Our stories have been hidden um, to the point where now they don't want you to even talk about it in the schools. They want it out of the school system. Let's just forget about it. Let's forget it didn't happen. It happened. So what are you going to do to heal? America is really hurting on both sides, on black side and white side. One side don't want to hear the story because they don't want to feel bad. Well, hey, we've been feeling bad for 400 years. 400 years we've been feeling bad. So help us to stop feeling bad by acknowledging our stories, by acknowledging the fact that this did happen, it was a bad time in our country, so how are we gonna help these people heal? And in turn, we can heal ourselves. Because right now, we're in a fight. A fight to keep the stories going. And if we don't stand together and say that it needs to be told, we're gonna have a generation of children coming up thinking that everything in America is good and what they're saying is wrong and so and so and so and so and all of that. We gotta learn from our past because people that don't learn from the past will repeat it that has been told for centuries, and there's no truth has ever been told but that one. If you don't learn from the past, you will repeat it again. And unfortunately, I can see it beginning to stir. 
So that's why this is so important. We need to get it out there. We need to talk about it. We need to discuss it. We need to heal from it. We need to cry about it. Anything. As long as we tell the story and tell the true story and all the story, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in my closing remarks here, I just want to leave you with three things, or I just want to mention three things. One, um, this is an opportunity uh, for all of us to gain greater knowledge in something that is an essential part of the American narrative, and that is the Underground Railroad. Without question, it is an essential part of the American narrative. And we do, and we're doing it, that, that movement, that social justice movement, we are doing an injustice if we glance over it and are very superficial about our understanding of it. Secondly, um, come back and join us here. The National Underground Railroad Freedom Center is a resource. It is a resource for leading towards the reconciliation that you talked about, dear. It's a resource for greater education. It's a resource to have those tough, difficult conversations about race, about uh, the intersection of politics and race, about the intersection of the socialities and race, um, and how that plays out. And so, and then lastly, I will say is this, uh, is, um, is bring a friend with you. If you come back and join us, bring a friend, bring a family member with you. Uh, bring someone who may not have that understanding. Uh, expose them to the resource that is here as the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center as we continue to bring forth these meaningful conversations. And lastly, I want to thank you. If we can give our panel a wonderful applause, Dr. Chrissy Hyman, <laughs> Phil Parrish, and Novella Nemo. Thank you very much, and all of you have a wonderful evening, safe trip home. Thank you.